Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Owen Humphreys. I'm a registered find specialist at Museum of London Archaeology and a postdoc student at Kingston University. What I'm going to be talking to you about today goes back a year. Actually, Facebook reminded me that my viva was a year ago last week about my PhD research, which was about Roman tools, a subject which I'm sure you can imagine the debate around is feverish. <laughs> I'm slightly worried, looking at the rest of the programme and after that last talk, what I'm going to say today might come across as a bit ivory tower, because I'm talking about academic research in a PhD university context. I'm not going to be talking that much about the findings of my project, more the way that it came about and the way that it was run, um, because it was done as a collaborative venture between a university and a museum, and I think that that brought extra value to both organisations. Lest you think that I'm going to be too weighty and academic in this matter, first thing I want to talk to you about is zombies. <laughs> um, this is, in a way, a sequel to a talk we gave that me and my uh, old supervisor, Caroline MacDonald, gave at the Society of Museum Archaeologists Conference back in 2015. And Caroline got up, this was her idea, and talked about her worry about zombie collections. The idea that a collection could appear to be living from the outside, they could get visitors through the door, they could put on lovely exhibitions, but on the inside be stagnating and dying, with the material not being used to generate new knowledge, with the people in the museum not really understanding what they've got. And this was born from her experiences working in museums at the time. So specifically with the Museum of London, they were in a situation where the collection was continuing to grow at a, a rapid rate, mainly through, impact, through the uh, input of commercial excavations. Uh, Adam is the manager now of the London Archive, which as mentioned is the largest archaeological archive in the world. The sort of things that go into the archive are not, not the same sort of things that make fantastic museum displays all the time. It's more, you know, structural reports and bits of pottery. So you need to find ways of feeding this information back into the museum. Because this is a museum for London, London has a very diverse and increasingly diversifying population, they need to speak to a wide range of audiences, and that means that they need to find different stories. They can't just talk about conquest and soldiers all the time. At the same time, just a few years after the financial crash, although I don't think things have gotten much better in the last five years, there were a lot of pressures on museum funding. So there wasn't really the scope in, within the museum's internal budget to carry out big research projects on their material. And at the same time, the role of the curator was changing from being a resident archaeological expert into being a collections manager, facilitating other people coming in and doing varied things with the collection. So they needed very much to encourage external researchers. And this project is about Roman archaeology, and Roman archaeology at the time also had a number of issues that needed to be addressed. There was a growing research interest in uh, social identity, but still mired in discussions of Romanization and colonialization and ethnic identity. Um, partially this might be because they were trying to come up with new things to say about the past using a lot of the same old data. There's growing interest that's still going on in materiality and artifact studies, the idea that objects take an active role in constructing the social conditions of the past. But at the same time that people are interested in this from a theoretical standpoint, fewer people had actually been going and analysing artifacts hands-on. There had been a big decline in the amount of typological cataloging work taking place since the 1990s. <laughs> and this was even leading to issues in things like commercial archaeology, with key texts on artifact groups being decades out of date, long out of print, and difficult to get hold of. And because nobody is swimming in money at the moment, university archaeology departments facing financial pressures from the institution of the tuition fee system, declining student numbers, which means that there's less stable employment in universities and therefore a need to promote academic-type research outside of the university environment. So these were the problems facing my two supervisors back when they first started talking about this in 2013. Uh, Helen Eckhart on the left, Professor of Archaeology at the University of Reading, and Caroline MacDonald, then Senior Curator of the uh, Museum of London, now Manager of the Great North Museum in Newcastle. They realised they could solve a lot of their issues and make good on a lot of their opportunities by working together. So what they needed to do was come together to design collaborative projects that could create new data sets for use in academic archaeology. 
But rather than waiting for some amazing new thing to be found, they could do so by making use of stored museum collections, unpublished excavated material held in archives. And they could use this material to create new narratives by combining the academic theoretical interests of the time with the data sets provided by museum artifacts. They could use these to focus on currently understudied aspects of the Roman period and present them in different ways to different audiences. But of course, a project of this type needs to be able to attract external funding. The scheme they turn to is something called the Collaborative Doctoral Award. At the time, it was only um, a few years old. It was young in archaeological terms. Um, and this is a funding scheme established by the Arts and Humanities Research Council with the aim of providing money for collaborative doctoral projects that were co-supervised by a university and a, a, a non-university institution, in this case, the Museum of London. The AHRC would provide money for tuition fees to the university, a stipend to keep the student going for three years. That was later expanded to four, but not when I did it. Um, and it does require an input from the non-university organisation. In this case, it was £1,000 a year of research expenses by the museum, which, though not inconsiderable, is a lot less than they'd have to pay a member of their own staff to go off for three years uh, conducting purely research. Um, and the aims of this were very much to encourage collaboration, um, to access resources that aren't normally available to people just working in the university context and to provide people with work experience outside of university so that at the end of it you're getting, um, not necessarily archaeologists, but people um, who are able to work outside of just the university system who can go into something like a museum and continue doing research perhaps. What they settled on as the topic they're most interested in was Roman tools. So, London has one of the largest collections of Roman tools in Europe. Because of the preservation conditions in the city, they are some of the best preserved. Uh, when some of these objects were dug up in the 1950s, the workmen would resharpen chisels and use them, or suspend three-ton weights from iron hooks that they found. Uh, that's how good the preservation was. This is a collection that's been amassed over a period of about 200 years worth of excavations in the city. But over that time, they've never been collected together, never systematically analysed, and the majority of them have never been published. So unless you're actually working in London, uh, able to go and visit the museum, most people aren't able to make use of these. These objects form key parts of many of the museum's displays on Roman London, but the actual information about them is quite limited. It's mainly just saying, here is evidence of leatherworking, here is evidence of woodworking in the most general sense. And at the wider academic level, the only book on analysing uh, Roman tools in English um, came out in 1985. It's been out of print for ages. Um, you'll have to pay up to about £200 to get a copy of it, which really is limiting the degree to which find specialists can interpret new finds. So this is the point where they applied for funding, they granted it, they advertised it. I was working in commercial archaeology at the time. I applied for it, got it, hooray. Um, so for the rest of today, I'm going to talk about, not the rest of today, the rest of the next 20 minutes. <laughs> I, could, I could easily talk to you about this all day, but no one wants that. I'm going to talk to you about the ways in which this project being run as a collaborative venture with co-supervision by the museum and the university led to increased benefit for both organisations and for the wider society. Um, looking first at data gathering. Um, I talk about this as a collection of London's Roman tools. It's not actually one collection. It's been built up over about 200 years. It's scattered. Um, some of the artefacts ended up in Canada. Um, so you need someone to go through and bring all this stuff together. By doing this as a PhD project, you get somebody with a level of obsessive dedication that you just don't get if you're paying someone nine to five to do a job. This is the only thing they have to do with three years of their life, and they're kind of staking everything that comes afterwards on it. So take the Lark, for example, largest urban archaeological archive in the world, does not yet have a central database. With a PhD student, you will get someone who is willing to go through every site database, publication, gathered here, through the card index, through the x-rays, um, look at every bit of un undated ironwork in order to find all of the possible Roman tools. And that's what I did. In all, um, through various collections, uh, I looked at over a thousand objects and catalogued about 837 of them, I think, finally got onto the uh, report. And what this process did is it led to a significant amount of data enrichment, which is primarily, in the first instance, good for the museum. So 
This is a typical catalogue entry from one of the objects in the museum when I started. It's basically an electronic transcription of the original paper record when it came in in 1895. And this is what they get at the end of it. Much more measurements, detailed descriptions, and typological information. Every object photographed. And because we were collaborating with the museum from the start, the database I recorded this onto was made to be compatible with the Museum of London's own collections database. So at the end of this, the information could be quickly exported over by a couple of clicks of a button. So all of this information is now produced to update the museum's own database, and I'm hoping that um, soon this can make its way onto the collections online service so that people can find all the Museum of London objects, at least, um, just through a click of the web browser. In terms of analysis, there was a lot. I think it really helped having this fantastic collection that no work had been done on this particular material, very little work had been done in this field for the last um, 30 years. So what then I ended up producing was three times the maximum accepted word limit for a thesis at the University of Reading. But it's amazing what you can get away with by calling something an appendix. <laughs> in this, you will find, if you want them, around 56 updated typologies, distribution dating analysis. Um, there's a long consideration of the function of the tools, synthesized with other evidence for craft in Roman London, and an analysis of depositional context, ritual deposition, material consumption. I'm not going to go into all of that now. I'm just going to give you one example of the sort of interpretation I think you can only draw out of this material by having this super detailed academic approach. Um, I'm going to talk to you about planks. Uh, apologies if you're regretting coming into this hall today instead of the other one. So planks are actually kind of interesting. It appears that there were pre-made planks available for sale in Roman London to specific dimensions. We find in lots of different objects and buildings, planks with the same dimensions, which implies that somebody is centrally producing them. That means that if you want to put up a building with a nice plank floor, all you need is a saw and a hammer and some nails. You don't need to reduce the wood from a tree yourself. If you want to put together a coffin, again, it makes it a lot simpler process. But there are multiple ways of making planks using different types of tools, and these can tell us a lot about social organisation of labour in the city. So the main method used to make these is a sawing method. Uh, you start off with your log, you use an axe to trim it down to a nice square shape, and then you prop it up on trestles. And using this massive two-person saw, you can just peel, log, uh, peel planks off the side of it that will be um, the dimensions of your prepared core start. Um, to do this, you need teams of multiple people who are working at producing large quantities of one particular object. And they need, in particular, this special type of very big framed saw, which appears in Roman London. It does not appear in pre-Roman Britain. So the existence of this type of object doesn't just tell us that they were sawing up very big things. It tells us, in combination with the evidence of the preserved woodwork, that we have a workshop structure in which multiple people are working in a sort of semi-specialised way to produce a particular type of object that can then get fed into a wider commercial system. Now, in the Middle Ages, they weren't doing this. What you do is you take wedges and, and these broad-bladed axes and trim down and split um, logs into planks. This is something that seems to appear in the late Roman period into the early Middle Ages, when these sorts of broad-bladed axes first appear. And as well as being a change in the type of tool that we're seeing, what this could also be implying is that we're seeing a change in workshop structure, away from big workshops, multiple people making one type of object, towards individual carpenters making something as they need it from a tool set that can act in a more versatile way. And the focus of the interpretive side of this project wasn't on the tools themselves so much as the craftspeople and agricultural workers in London. There's a sort of tendency in archaeology to say there were traders here, there were soldiers here, there were administrators, and then there was everyone else. And that everyone else, which would have been the majority of people who were using tools every day in their nine to five, um, really haven't been discussed before. And that's what we're trying to do here. And so through that sort of close analysis of the tools uh, synthesized with the other evidence for working practice, you can say a number of things about them that we couldn't say before. So that they uh, practice a lot of very specific trades, not just metal working, we can say specifically goldsmithing, specifically shoemaking, specifically barrel making, rather than just woodwork. Some of these could be highly specialized, with specialized tools. 
that indicate a degree of investment and status on behalf of the people who are doing that work. But at the same time, we see technologies that approach a sort of production line mentality, which means you can have specialised manufacture with maybe even a lower status than people carrying it out. We've got evidence of people coming from a wide variety of cultural backgrounds, almost certainly including migrant workers, using European or Roman style technologies from a really early date in this city, more so than anywhere else in the country. And we can also see from the amount of material that was deposited and the way it was deposited, that even people relatively low down the social scale were consuming and discarding large amounts of material culture in this period, which is not what we'd expect. So that's sort of where the project was a year ago when I finished it. And then you get on to how to get this material out there. Obviously, this being a PhD, sort of academic publication is the obvious route to go down. Because we've got so much material, we can put out a lot of stuff. So if you're really boring like me, and you want to know what tools look like and how they're dated, there's going to be a monograph on typology, which includes a full catalogue of the material. And I'm looking at ways of doing that as an open access publication, so that anyone who's interested in this material can go on and look at it. Although this isn't a subject that really excites people, there is a particular group of particularly old men who really want to know about Roman hammers. Um, for people who aren't that interested in specifics of the material, there's going to be another monograph um, with the more interpretive side of things that's um, about craft workers in Roman London, about industry and the economy. And I think that'll be more of interest to general archaeologists who want to know more about the city, as well as the museum when they're looking for material to inform their displays. I should also mention, I've got to say more, um, I don't think there's been a single monograph dedicated to a finds group from Roman London before. There's one on pottery, and there's one coming out on finds from the Temple of Mithras excavation, but it's something that we've really been deficient with considering the amount of material that comes from the city. There's going to be some short papers as well. In terms of getting out of the academic sphere, um, I was lucky to be able to pop an exhibition while I was um, doing this project. Um, and kind of a counterpoint to what we heard before about um, community curation, um, I was really lucky to be doing this um, from inside the Museum of London. It meant that I had access to their designers, to their technicians, their curators, when putting this display on. So I could say to somebody, I really want to build a display cabinet with a field and a hedge in it. And they would say, how high do you want the hedge? <laughs> um, this was accompanied by a blog post that became most read in the uh, museum's history. Uh, so clearly there is more interest in tools than we thought. And um, because they've got a professional press team, they were able to put out a press release, and that got picked up by um, quite important publications like current archaeology magazine. So that's probably the most exposure that these tools have had ever. Um, longer term, the Museum of London is moving premises in the next few years, and so there'll be a complete redisplay of all their material. So having a research project like this uh, come along at this time means that there'll be a new resource for the curators to draw on when they're putting on these uh, new displays, so, which presumably will last for decades like the current ones have. So sort of summing up, my point here is that this is a different type of project. It isn't the same as a normal PhD. It isn't the same as normal in-house museum work. And the way that it's conducted brings benefits to sort of both institutions. Because it was co-supervised by the museum, we got amazing access to a unique collection. It meant that because I was almost working for them, I could go to the archive for weeks on end, looking through every drawer of paperwork, and they wouldn't get annoyed and throw me out. Um, it meant that there were increased opportunities for public outreach through the museum itself. But because it was a PhD research rather than in-house uh, museum work, it meant that they got a greater level of data enhancement and academic engagement with a discussion of what I think are quite interesting but more obscure topics that a time and resource press curator who also has a full job managing every other aspect of the museum wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. I mentioned as well that the point of this scheme was to encourage uh, long-term collaborative partnerships. I know that Helen Eckhart, my supervisor at Reading, is looking into new projects to do with finds from Roman London at the moment. Um, I've been lucky to get funding, again from the AHRC, um, to do a six-month project uh, down in the archive with Adam looking at the Roman leather work from London. And this is in collaboration with a man called John Hagger from the uh, Dorset Leather School. So we're trying here to integrate a sort of modern practitioner element into our um, collaboration on this material. That's something that's ongoing at the moment. Expect another talk about that in due time. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, provided resources for this project, Adam for inviting me here today, and Sifa for paying for it, and thank you very much.